Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord again, everybody. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we've come to rejoice and be glad in it. I want everybody to stand to your feet as we go into our praise and worship portion of our service. This is our last night. Our God has met us mightily every day. Uh, how many of you have high expectation for tonight, though? I do. Look at somebody up and down your row and tell them, say, God's going to get the glory out of this. I don't know what your this is tonight. Why don't you let him get the glory out of it? Oh, Lord, we give you praise. Thanks. Oh, Lord, we bless your name. We lift our voices to say thank you for your goodness and your mercies towards us for your goodness and your mercies towards us for And your mercy towards us, we offer praise. Now all over the sanctuary tonight, come on and help us lift the song here. Oh Lord, oh Lord we give you praise. Mercy 
Has he been good to anybody tonight? Oh, your oh, your goodness. goodness. Have your mercies toward us.
need him. Jesus. Blessing, Savior. It's worthy to be praised. Everybody say. What's his name tonight? Jesus. Blessed Savior. Blessed Savior. Worthy, worthy. He's worthy yeah. to yeah, yeah. be praised. Stay down there. Glory. Glory. Come to give him. Tonight, Zion. Jesus. Blessed Savior. Blessed Savior. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. From the right.
saying it like y'all mean it. Tell them, say, our God. Some of y'all still too quiet. Tell somebody, say, our God. Some of y'all still too quiet. I need y'all talking to somebody. Say, our God is going to make everything all right. Now, if you believe that God's going to make everything all right, just put those hands together and give him some praise in the building right now. I got to sing a little bit of this for somebody. They asked me to sing this a little bit. For y'all that's watching, we just gonna sing just a little, that's all. Put those hands together. still looking at me. I said, look at your neighbor and tell them, say, neighbor, 
in spite of all I've been through, I got to tell you the real reason why I'm so excited about being here tonight. If you look at me and I'm lifting my hands, if you look at me and I got dancing in my feet, if you look at me and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, can I tell you why? Can I tell you why? Can I tell you why? He woke me up this morning. We greet you in the master's name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ For he's the reason that we're here We're not here for no other reason than to magnify, to glorify To extol, to love on To worship, to magnify the God of our salvation I am Bishop Marvin Sapp and I am the senior pastor Of the Chosen Vessel Church here in the city of Fort Worth, Texas, and indeed we greet you and we're grateful to God for this amazing opportunity to be able to share in this capacity. And for those of you who are watching, you are absolutely in for a treat. We are in our Three Wise Men Revival Series. Amen, 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 amen. So we just want to let you know how grateful we are for you watching and viewing us from all over this entire world on this another Tuesday night. I know y'all usually used to me. I'm, I actually dressed up for y'all tonight. I dressed up for y'all tonight. Y'all know, y'all know, you know, I'm, I'm t-shirt, I'm sweatpants, you know, that's what we do on Tuesday. I'm usually sitting at my house, but you know, we got a special guest with us tonight. So we wanted to make sure that we just did everything that was necessary in order to make sure that they were comfortable. And not only that, but I ain't wore a suit in a very long time. So I wanted to make sure I wore a suit because Sunday, we're going back to normal. I'm telling you right now, I got a new t-shirt I'm going to wear on Sunday. I'm telling you, brand new, it's crisp, it's clean. So I'll make sure I have my t-shirt on Sunday. But, uh, you know, I'm just grateful to God. To all of our visitors that are watching, all of those of you who are visiting here for the first time, we thank God for everybody in the house. Come up, put your hands together. Everybody bless God. Amen, 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 amen. And I want to move as expeditiously as possible because I want to get this man of God up. I want him to share with us on tonight. So y'all know that question that I need to ask. There's a question that I need to ask our church tonight. And it's a very simple question. Uh, do y'all do know what time it is, right? I said, what time is it, family? It is C time in the house. And as always, there's a multiplicity of ways that we can plant seed into the kingdom of God. But here at the Chosen Vessel Church, there are four specific ways. You can sow your seed via Givelify by just looking for the words, the Chosen Vessel Cathedral. Make sure you just don't look for the logo. Look for the words. The Chosen Vessel Cathedral. Look for the words, The Chosen Vessel Cathedral. You can give via Cash App. That's Cash Sign TCVC Ministries. You can actually text the word. Text the word GIVE. Text the word GIVE to 833-948-1987. You can also give via Cash. If you're in the sanctuary and you want to plant a seed via Cash or if you want to write a check, you can make it payable to TCVC. All you got to do is just lift your hand up. We'll get an envelope in your hand. Our brother servants and our ushers are in the aisles even as we speak. And we're going to get an envelope in your hand, absolutely. If you're writing a check and you're sending it in the mail, you can send your check to 4650 Campus Drive in the city of Fort Worth, Texas. As always, I tell you all to make sure you look up the zip code. I'm not going to give you the zip code. The reason being is because once you look up the zip code, you'll get the opportunity, if you will, to find out more information about the ministry that you are seeding and sowing into. I've been challenging you all on a consistent basis to make sure there should be at least two to 300 individuals tonight that will seed, that will sow a seed of $20. I challenge you all every Tuesday, every Tuesday, and we're not gonna stop doing that. Every Tuesday night, you need to plant a seed of $20. For those who are in the sanctuary, for those that are watching, make sure you're seeding and you're sowing. And I tell people to look up again the zip code simply because I'm a strong believer that you need to understand what you're sowing into. One thing I believe is that this is the house that favor is building. God is building this house. Favor is building this house because this is a place where we are taught that it is the liberal soul that's going to be made fat. We're taught that God gives seed to sowers. So we believe in seeding. We believe in sowing. We believe in giving because we understand that we serve a God who is reciprocal. 
meaning that if I seed, he's going to give back. I must initiate it first. If I give, he's going to give it back to me. Good measure, pressed out, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. I believe that God's got somebody somewhere who is assigned to fund vision. Not just the church's vision, but some of y'all got some visions. I can't get no help here. And I'm telling you that your obedience in giving, your obedience in seeding, your obedience in sowing will activate and find that individual. They'll find you. They gonna, I'm telling you, they're looking for you now. They are looking for you now. And what has been holding you up is your inability to trust God in the area of seed time. Because, you know, as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and harvest. And that's why if you note, notice, I never say give money. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You give seed. And the reason why I'm a strong believer that we sow seed, watch this. Because when we sow seed, we give it an assignment. And its assignment is simply to go into our futures, to create avenues and streams of wealth and increase. Well, we as individuals won't live off of that which we make, but we're going to live off of the overflow of that which we sow. Is anybody expecting a harvest up in here? It's going to rain in your life. And I declare and decree you shall never be broke another day. I know I'm not. I'm not going to ever be broke another day in my life. And it's because I understand the principle. And if you work the principle, the principle will work for you. Have y'all given? Y'all given? If you've given in the sanctuary and you got your envelope filled, I'll just hold your envelope up and the ushers will come and grab your envelopes even as we speak. Amen. Amen. And they're going to give them to who they're supposed to give them to so we can make sure everything is everything. We're going to move forward as expeditiously as possible because I want to get this man up. A very gifted preacher and teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has literally traveled the width and the breadth of this entire United States preaching the kingdom, preaching the kingdom, old school preacher, old school teacher, and uh, when I got here, we went to lunch one day, and I, I told him, I said, I'm inviting you to our church, and I want you to come and share, I remember being a younger man, he's not much older than me, but when I was a young man, young man, I remember going to hear him preach at different conventions, and, and it's just a great privilege and a great honor to have him to be with us. And that's none other than Reverend William T. Glenn. Come on, let's thank God for him now. That's my introduction to him from the Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church. But before, before, before he comes and shares, I believe, y'all tell me what's what. Okay, everybody, okay, everybody in position? Y'all got me? Okay, super. We're gonna have his, I think, uh, music selection from his praise team. They're gonna come and they're gonna share music selections. Uh, before he preaches. Now listen, this is all y'all going to hear from me. After they get through sharing musically, the next voice you will hear will be Pastor William T. Glenn from the Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church. Come on, y'all put your hands together even now.
prayed about it and he gave me peace of mind I prayed about it and he stepped in on time I stopped worrying went down on my knees gave that problem to Jesus he gave me the victory I prayed about it and God still answered he still answers prayer
thank you for this privilege of worship. We thank you for the total sufficiency we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our prayer is that you will prepare our heads and hearts to be both receptive and responsive to the preaching of your word. And then help us to take your word and apply it to our lives for the living out of these days. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. How blessed we are to gather in his house, in his name, one more time. Let me thank this pastor, Bishop Sapp, for inviting me to come and share with you this evening. And to the Chosen Vessel Church, you did a, a great thing. Amen, with the calling of this pastor. Amen. <laughs> Fort Worth is a better place because he's here. Amen. And we praise and we thank God for all that the Lord is doing in him and through him. And we look with great anticipation of all of the wonderful things the Lord is going to do in the life and ministry of the Chosen Vessel Church. Amen. Amen. Bless you, bless you, bless you, Bishop. Um, now, you've been here on the mountain, I understand, these past two nights. And it's good to see Pastor Davis here. Amen. Pastor Taylor, these preachers. Um, but you know, you can't stay at high elevation for extended lengths of time. That's hazardous to your health. A amen. Now, God never intended for man to live on a mountain. He has never made two mountains without placing a valley between them. But you don't leap from one mountain to the next. You have to come down and go through the valley. It becomes my task now to bring you back down in the valley where, where life is really lived. I was thinking about this that's centered around three wise men. And we don't know how many wise men but we base it on three gifts given. And I was just thinking about it. That third gift was mud. That was ancient embalming fluid. I'm, pray with me for life tonight. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That, there's a word I want to try and lift up. That's found in the gospel recorded by Luke. I want to begin reading at verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come. And thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have 
is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Verse 28, and he was angry and would not go in. I want to talk this evening about don't miss the party. God bless you. Luke chapter 15 is the lost and found column of the New Testament. In it, Jesus gives us three stories. One is about a lost sheep. The second is about a lost coin. And the third is about a lost son. In all three stories, that which is lost is found. It is recovered and restored. To, to remind us that God's ability to find us is greater than our ability to get lost. That you can never get so lost that God cannot find you. Jesus says a certain man had two sons. And his younger son comes to him and says, Give me that portion that falleth to me. That which is going to come to me after you're dead, I want it now. And brothers and sisters, that's one of the tragedies of youth is that when you're young, you want it all now, here's what the boy was literally saying to his father. I wish you were dead, but since you're not, give me what's coming to him. And his father divides half of all that he has and gives to this younger son. He liquidates it, packs up, and takes his journey into a far country. And I need to remind us tonight that the far country is more than geography. It's a condition of the soul. And there in that far, far country, he enters into what uh, Jesus calls riotous living. And the Bible says when he had spent all that he had, came to be in want, he ends up in a pig pen of a situation. But there in that pig pen, broke and broken, he came to himself. And brothers and sisters, every now and then you have to thank God for the value of an empty pocketbook. There's some lessons some of us never learn until our pockets got empty. There's some discipline that never came into our lives until our pockets were empty. Sitting there broken, broken, he comes to himself and he remembers in his father's house, even his hired servants had food and some to spare. And he says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up and go back home to my father. And when I get back home, I'm going to say to him, I'm, I'm no longer worthy. Be called your son. I've sinned before you and before heaven and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me one of your hired servants. And I, I would imagine he rehearsed that speech all the way home. That's the way you do. When you messed up away from home, you try to get your story together before you get back home. And all the way home, he just kept saying, Father, I've sinned before heaven and before you and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Just make me as one of your hired servants. And, and he's on his way back home, but he's far off. 
but his father looks out because he's been waiting and watching. And he looks and he can see that son returning home. John Jawood says one of the characteristics of the eyes of the divine is that he can see his children in a long distance. He, 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 he's on his way home, but he's yet afar off. He doesn't look like he looked when he left home, but his father knows his son. And he doesn't wait for that boy to get back home. But the Bible says he ran to meet him. And here we have an amazing picture of God. Because this is the only place in Scripture where it is even inferred God ever got in a hurry. God doesn't run, God walks. He doesn't walk with God. Amen. But when he looks out, and he can see that wayward child on his way back home that's running and hugging and kissing. And that boy begins to recite that speech he's been rehearsing. Father, I've sinned before heaven and before you, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But the father interrupts. He never allows this boy to get to this hired servant section. He literally says to the boy, son, I don't need any more servants. I need a son. I don't have a servant shortage around here, but I am short on a son. And he turns to his servants and says, get the best robe. Put his on his back. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. And that calf we've been fattening up for a special day. Well, his day has come. We're going to eat, drink, and be merry. And there's a party going on in the father's house. And this other brother, this elder brother, is on his way in from the field and he hears music and dancing and he calls a servant and he wants to know what is this celebration all about. And we begin to get a picture of this older son. He's on his way in from the field and there's a party going on in the house. And he stops and he calls a servant. Makes you wonder why did he do that? He's a son of the house. He doesn't have to call a servant to find out what's going on. He's a son of the house. Kind of like church people. They start asking advice about spiritual matters and what's going on at that church to non-church going folk. They go want to talk about, ask questions about the pastor, the folk they know don't like the pastor. And the servant says, haven't you heard? Your brother came back home today. But he didn't come back like he left. Left with his head lifted up in pride. But he came back with his head bowed down in shame. He left here saying, give me, but he came back saying, make me. He left here wondering if the house was worthy of him, but he came back knowing that the house, he's not worthy of the house and because your daddy got him back safe and sound. He has killed for him the fatty calf. And the Bible says he became angry and he would not go in. And undoubtedly that servant makes his way in the house and says to the father, you've got a problem. 
your older son was on his way in and he asked what was going on. And when I explained to him what this celebration was all about, he got mad. In fact, about it, he's standing outside and he says he's not coming in. And the father goes out and he pleads with this son. Come on in. And he says to his dad, I don't understand what this party is all about. Look, man, I never left you. I've stayed here and I've done everything you've ever asked me to do. You've never given me as much of, as a go to make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, who's wasted your money on harlots, prostitutes, whatever you want to call them, you have killed for him the fatty calf. Brothers and sisters, this older son's problems didn't begin this day. They simply came to the surface this day. That's the way church mess is. When you hear about it, that's not when it got started. It's been started. It's just the day that it surfaced. He missed the party when he's standing just outside of the door. And I, I surmise that every Sunday when we get to church, amen, we get there should be for celebration. Every Sunday ought to be a party and like this elder brother, there's some folk who go one step farther than him. They come in the house and still miss the party. What caused him to miss the party? Well, first of all, it had to do with his thought. He wasn't thinking clearly. He's so caught up in that calf that was roasting on the barbecue that he seemed to have forgotten all about his daddy's deep freeze. He seemed to have forgotten that he lived in the father's house. He went to bed every night in the father's house. He ate every meal at the father's table. The food he ate, the clothes he wore, all that he had had come from the father. And brothers and sisters like this elder son, if we are not careful, we can get so caught up in the spectacular, the extraordinary, that we miss seeing what God is doing for us in the ordinary. Our tendency is to only see God working in the spectacular and the ordinary, extraordinary, that we miss what God does every day in the ordinary. Do you know you're here tonight for the most part only because God has worked in your life not in the extraordinary but in the ordinary. You woke up this morning. No bolt of lightning struck you. But in the words of my grandmother, the Lord just stopped by early this morning and touched your body with the fingertip of love. And your eyes came open to see a brand new day, one you had never seen before, and surely you'll never see again. That's God working in ordinary. You had shelter over your head. You had food for your table and clothes for your back. You were in your right mind. That's God working in the ordinary. You got in an automobile and drove up and down an expressway, and the Lord blessed you and kept you and allowed you to make your way here tonight. You ought to lift up holy hands and tell God, thank you for working in the ordinary. We get 
so caught up in the spectacular that we are prone to overlook the millions of bite-sized blessings God grants us every day. Think about it. God blesses us so much that if we're not careful, his blessings begins to look like reruns. But I need to tell you, our God doesn't deal with reruns. Jeremiah says his mercies are new. Every morning, God doesn't deal with reruns. The psalmist put it equally well when he said, this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. God doesn't recycle days. God, our maker, grants us a new day every morning. And here's your shout. Only God can make a day. Amen. Amen. And if we're not careful, we tend to take God's blessings for granted because they appear to be just reruns. This boy wasn't thinking clearly. He missed the party because of his thoughts. Norman Vincent Peale says the Thanksgiving season was approaching and he had a man, friend, who was visiting him. And he asked his friend, what are you thankful for this season? The friend says, well, you know, things haven't been going well for me. And he sat and thought. He says, I can't think of anything. Norman Vincent Peale pulled out a sheet of paper and handed him a pen. He said, just, just think. And just write down what you are thankful for. He sat there with the pen in his hand and never wrote a word. Norman Vincent Peale said he pulled up a chair beside him and took the pen and said, let me help you. He said, where did you sleep last night? He said, at home in my bed. He said, shelter over your head. A bed to sleep in. He said, did you eat anything? He said, yes, I ate breakfast at my table. He said, food on your table. Where did those clothes come from? Out of my closet, clothes on your back. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you T-H-I-N-K, you'll always remember to T-H-A-N-K. This boy missed a party because he wasn't thinking clearly. He, he missed a party not only because of his thoughts, but secondly, because of his talk. He has some interesting conversation. In verse 30, he says to his daddy, as soon as this thy son was come, who have devoured your money, your living, he's wasted it on harlots. You have killed for him the fatted calf. Well, Jesus in this story never said that that boy wasted that money on harlots. He said riotous living. But brothers and sisters, your attitude, your actions and your talk is a mirror into your own heart. And rather than exposing his younger brother's son, he exposes what had been rooted in his own heart. Perhaps he was upset because every day on his way to the field, while working in the field, coming out of the field, he was thinking about his brother in the far country. And he was thinking if it was me and I had my daddy's money and I was out there, this is what I would have been doing. Sisters, it's kind of like that brother. He gets mad and he gets in a drunken stupor 
and he says a whole lot of ugly things, yeah. and then he sobers up, yeah. and he wants to take it back yeah. by saying, well, I was drunk. I think I need to remind you. Yeah. A drunk man's speech is a sober man's mind. Yeah. He's been thinking it all the time. Amen. He says to his daddy, as soon as this, thy son was come. The new, the new King James Version says, as soon as this son of yours was come. He seemed to have forgotten that the same act that restored the father's son had restored his brother. That this young man wasn't just anybody. It was his brother. Amen. And, 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 and one thing about being a brother is being forgiven of another brother's transgression. Be it blood or any other brother. So it would suggest that some people are just not brotherly. I grew up in South Louisiana, and, and it rarely ever gets cold, you know, a day and then it warms back up. So we played baseball year-round. My, my older brother, Ted, he, he played first base. He, he, he was the tallest guy on the team. He played first base. I, I played out in the outfield when they would let me play. And one day I decided I'm going to play first base. Shortest thing out there. But I got his glove and I went to first base and I started warming up the infield. He, he just sitting over on the side. I didn't even say anything. And about time for the game to start, he walked over to first base and he said, give me my glove and get on out there where you play. And I was about to hand him his glove. And then Eddie Robinson said, Tim, I wouldn't give him that glove if I was you. <laughs> Ted doesn't own first base. And he looked at me again. He, just, he said, give me my glove. I looked at him and said, take it. <laughs> and when he reached for it, I slugged it. We fought all over that diamond. Went back home. Grass stack. Hair all out of Clothes torn. And my mother asked when we walked in, what happened to y'all? And we explained what had happened. And she said, I'll tell you what. Go down to my bedroom and take your shirts off. She went outside with a butcher knife and cut limbs out of a tree. Platted them up. She came back inside, and she says, now this first one, meaning there was going to be a second one <laughs> when my father got home. She said, but this first beating is about you allowing somebody outside of this house to come between you. There ought to be some brotherliness between brothers. He says, as soon as this thy son has come, who has devoured your living with harlots, you have killed for him the fatty calf. It keeps coming back to this calf. But brothers and sisters, this story reminds us That we can be so taken up with what God is doing for someone else that we miss seeing all God is doing in our lives. I, I stand here tonight. I have no reason to be envious or jealous 
of anything God is doing for someone else. It's a long way from Elizabeth, Louisiana, where I was born and raised, to Fort Worth, Texas, to Mount Olive Baptist Church. I was trying to explain to Pastor about that town I was born in, and he was saying, he kept saying, but yeah, yeah, I know, I've been to some small places in Louisiana. No, you've never been to one this small. When we moved away from there, there were only two streets of black people. Town didn't have a traffic light. There are 532 people there tonight, now. Two of them are black. I know both of them. God has been good to me. The Lord has blessed me far above anything I could have ever imagined, hoped for, or ever deserved. Here is this older boy grumbling about what his father has done for his younger brother. He's grumbling over grace. You, you know, there are times when you want to have some sympathy for this older brother. On the surface, it looks like he had a right to act and say the way he acted and what he said. I mean, after all, his father had given that younger boy half, which was too much. The older son always got the larger portion. Amen. Amen. He went out and wasted it all and came back broke and threw him a party. Well, whose money do you think that was coming out of? But what the Lord is teaching us in this text is that God's love violates our sense of right and wrong. God's love is so great and so deep that it transcends our sense of what's right. You think you deserve all God is doing for you tonight? You think you deserve to live where you live, to be right like you right? You think you deserve to have survived this far through COVID? No, it's grace. He missed the party because of his thought. Because of his talk, but ultimately because of his walk. He's outside the door and refused to walk in. Amen. 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 His body was in the house, but his heart was in the far country. Old Jays used to sing, your bodies here with me. But your mind is on the other side of town messing me around. Oh, brothers and sisters, he could have been in the house. He could have been in the party. But rather than being in the party, He's outside pouting. Oh, yes, brothers and sisters, uh, when you read Luke chapter 15, everybody uh, is happy uh, but this uh, elder brother. Yes, Lord, uh, yeah, the shepherd is happy. The woman is happy. The younger son is happy. The father is happy. But this elder brother uh, is standing uh, on the outside and uh, he refused uh, to come in. Yes, Lord, uh, well, uh, did he ever uh, come in? 
the truth is uh, the story ends and he's still on the outside and I just believe uh, God uh, left this story open-ended and the reason uh, he left it open-ended is because uh, we all get uh, an opportunity uh, to write our own ending to the story have I got a witness and I thank God uh, I've written my ending uh, to my story and my ending is uh, I was sinking uh, deep in sin far uh, from the peaceful shore very deeply uh, stained within uh, I was seeking to rise no more but I thank God uh, the master uh, of life see uh, he heard uh, my despairing cry and from the waters uh, he lifted me now safe am I look at your neighbor give him a smile and tell him neighbor I thank God I wrote my ending and my ending is I came to Jesus just as I was I was weary worn and sad but I found in him a resting place and he has made me glad I thank God I've been redeemed I thank God I've been redeemed Anybody here Know you've been redeemed Anybody here Know you've been born again Tell them neighbor I'm in the party Neighbor I'm gonna sing my song Neighbor I'm going to lift up my hands, neighbor, I'm going to do my dance, because this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Anybody here know he's been good? Anybody here know he's made a way? He brought you out. He healed your body. He put food on your table, clothes on your back, money in your pocket, joy in your heart. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, this joy that I have, the world didn't give. This joy that I have, the world can't take away. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Ain't it all right? Can you say yes? Yes! Yes! Oh, 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 yes! Can you praise him right now? Can you praise him right now? 
Can you praise him right now? outside the house and I need to tell you if you've got a brother and he's still outside the house the final truth of the story is go get your brother and bring him in the party go get your sister and bring him in the party because he's worthy should learn that we need to change our thinking. We need to change our, our, our talking. We got to show more grace. There are those that are watching and there are those that are again still in the sanctuary that you may not know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins. You haven't been baptized in water, haven't experienced the baptism of the Spirit. You don't have to leave here the same way you came into these doors. You can leave here regenerated. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Regenerated. If you need to be regenerated, I need you to pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus. I am a sinner, and I'm in need of a Savior. I recognize that you shed your blood, that you died, that you got up with all power of heaven and earth in your hands. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and you are my Savior. Save me now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer in the sanctuary, if you prayed that prayer while you're watching, streaming, I just need you to do one thing for me. If you pray that prayer, I need you to text the word chosen to the number that you see on the screen. 817-442-6775. Again, text chosen to 817-442-6775. Maybe someone here in the sanctuary or even watching, you say, you know what, Bishop? I like the things that you're doing. I'd love to be a part of your ministry, but I don't live close to you. Or 
I'm in the area and I've been wanting to come and see what you all are doing in Fort Worth. And let me tell you, we're one church, two locations. We have a local assembly here in Fort Worth. And we also have our virtual assembly in town. And it's called Chosen Vessel Everywhere. You could be a member of this family of churches. And it's very easy. It's all you got to do. It's just text the word vessel to the number that's on the screen. That's 817-442-6775. 817-442-6775. I don't know about y'all, but I've had an amazing time these last three days. And I want to make this an annual event that we bring in individuals from across the state of Texas and even some from outside the state to come and to just, it's, it's time for fellowship, fam. It's time for fellowship. We have been fragmented and disconnected literally for almost two years. Folks are just beginning to come back to church. So if, if we can go to the basketball game, the football game, if you can go to North Park, if you can go to Clearfork, you go all these different places, you ought to be able to come and be with us as we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is the reason for the season. Am I right about it? We are in great time. Let's stand up and prepare to go. My goodness, this is perfect. It's 9 o'clock tonight. Please put your loving arms of protection around us. Keep us all from hurt, harm, and or danger until we assemble ourselves together again for such a time as this, where we're able to lift up our hands and give you glory, honor, and praise. Let us not forget this time of intimacy and fellowship. Allow us to take it with us, Lord God, and allow it to be a burning fire on the inside of us until we get back into our places of worship on this coming Sunday. Bless us. Make us a blessing, cover us, and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Consider yourselves dismissed. May God bless you. May God keep you. This is my prayer.